On today's episode of Homeworthy, we're taking you inside architect James Carter's breathtaking Birmingham home. James built his home with an approach similar to crafting a custom suit, tailored perfectly to house a lifetime's worth of cherished collections. Inside, you'll find magnificent structural details that form a sense of continuity throughout each space. James has created a beautiful home that is a time capsule of his life. A big thank you to Veranda for sponsoring today's Homeworthy episode. Inside the July-August issue of Veranda magazine is a love letter to summer. Linen designer Julia Amory invites readers into her idyllic homes in the Hamptons and Palm Beach, both blooming with beautiful florals and chintz. Then it's a postcard from Provence, a shopping story that transports you to the south of France. And not to miss, a jewelry feature about charms. These baubles are the quintessential summer accessory. And for more architecture and design stories, feast your eyes on these summer homes from the coast of Southern California to the mountains of North Carolina. And a special offer for our viewers, for 20% off a one-year subscription to Veranda, be sure to visit veranda.com homeworthy and use the code homeworthy. Enjoy. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Like and subscribe for more. Hello, Homeworthy. I'm James Carter. Welcome to my Birmingham home. Please come in. My name is James Carter. I'm an architect living here in Birmingham, and so welcome to Birmingham. I always have had an interest in houses, and when I was a little boy, I used to ride my bike around whenever they were building a new house and try to figure out the floor plans. This is back when I got in trouble for doing that. But I really never had any doubt that I would not want to design houses. And so I went off to school, and after graduation, came to Birmingham and was fortunate enough to work for a very well-established and talented firm of, uh, firm of architects doing primarily residential design. I worked for them for about 10 years and decided it was time for me to try my own thing. So at best around 1990, I established James F. Carter and we only do residential work and we try to do as few as we can a year. And we've done houses everywhere around the country, but primarily in the American South we do a lot of repeat business. I'll do someone's main home and then they're nice enough to ask us to do a second or a third and we call these people repeat offenders. Um, but it's nice. Our work is very intimate and you get to know your clients quite well. And uh, I am only an architect. I am not an interior decorator or a, a garden designer, but I have a huge interest in all aspects of the product and find that they all must work together. Um, I work basically, uh, work is my number one hobby and I can work as much as I'm allowed to work. Um, my second hobby is travel and that's primarily to see the work uh, of other people. And third, I love to collect books and read and that's pretty much all uh, about one and two. And so I'm also a collector. I love to bring things back from trips and travel, uh, travel to things. and. I love the idea that everything has some meaning to me. It may not be extraordinarily sentimental, but I can tell you pretty much where everything in this house came from over the last 30 years. Uh, well, the house was completed in 2013. Um, I bought the property in 2000 and lived in a little house on the property with the idea of tearing it down. And uh, I kept filling it up with things but the, the poor little house, I never really did any maintenance. And there were some great stories about when the ceiling fell in the laundry room and I just mopped it up and kept on going. And we had light fixtures falling off the house. And uh, in the 10 years I lived here, I had the exterior painted twice, but only on the front. <laughs> so by the time I left, it was about to fall in. And whenever it would rain, I would go around with a flashlight and check the ceilings to make sure I didn't have any drips. So, um, you know, I, you, the plans, you know, if you've learned as you get older, plans don't ever go through the way you thought. I thought I'd be in the house for two years and then I'd start this one. And I was here probably at least 10 years. 
and then it took three years to build. Uh, there's a lot of detail in here, and I was having good friends do help me with the work, and so that always takes longer. But uh, I told somebody, having lived in apartments and then in a little house that was sort of at best a cottage, the first morning you wake up and you walk around the house with a cup of coffee and the house is warm on a cold day, or the first time you look at it and you see the sprinkler system going off, watering the lawn, you feel like you've kind of made it, made it somewhere. And uh, I used to travel a lot and get in a great shower and, or a great bed and wish I had one like it, and now I do. Uh, welcome to my entry hall. The people who have not been here don't realize that Birmingham is rather mountainous. And so my house is built into the side of a hill. And so much like a New York townhouse, you enter on the lower level, which is here, and then you go up the steps to where everything else happens. So this, this level is basically nothing but storage, uh, future offs if I want one, the garages and things like that. But um, I think the entrance hall always has to make a really strong statement and tell you something about the house. Um, the things in here that I love the most, first off the floor, I had someone tell me when I was planning this that checkerboard floors had gone out of style. And I thought that was the most absurd thing I'd ever heard. So that kind of cinched the deal for the floor. But um, I tend to gravitate toward pieces of furniture that have a lively silhouette from a distance. Uh, things like these shield back chairs here. They have a nice line from a distance. And then when you get up close, they have a, a little bit of detail, which is very nice. And I'll think, when I was thinking about it for this uh, interview, I realized almost everything I own has a distant view and a close-up view. And so this chair here is a typical example. I love round, these Rondell portraits. They're bronze. I think they're French. Um, they are all based on the idea, I like seeing something across the room that you know, draws your eye in. And then when you get there, they have something going on that you can enjoy. But uh, the two things, that, well, there are three things in here that I'm particularly proud of. Um, when I was a little boy, I was in New York and um, uh, was at the Carlisle Hotel and saw a pair of Eagle-style consoles. And they used to be in the little vestibule off the elevator. And I thought they were the coolest things I'd ever seen. And over the years of my learning about architecture and interior design, I realized that my, best, my favorite architect, David Adler from Chicago, and his sister, um, Frances Elkins, used these consoles a lot. And so I decided one day that I had, I had to have some. So around 2008, a pair came up that were within my price range, and I purchased them upstairs. You'll see them in a moment. They're the real thing. But I was in an antique shop with a friend of mine in Atlanta and saw this console, uh, and it was painted gold, not real gold. And um, I looked at it, and I could tell that it was not a particularly old one, but I found out it was one of those consoles that I had seen in the Carlisle. And so I said, load it up, it's mine. So I, I did paint it white, but I thought it was amazing. And this is one of the first things I remember seeing as a young man that I really thought was cool, that I wanted one. It represents what I like furniture to do, and it has a strong shape, and it has nice detail up close, and it's sort of timeless. And um, the fact that they've become popular again uh, in a lot of decorating, maybe they never went away, it's just typical of good design. One of the things that I always wanted for my house was a tall case clock. And I never had quite the time to get when I had other things I was focusing on. And during COVID, I became more uh, uh, interested in auctions. And this clock came up for auction in New York and it had exactly what I wanted. It was the right period. Um, I like things from around 1780 to 1820. And it was made in London and I liked it because of the simple strong face. I bid on it, and to some amazement, I managed to get it. They brought it down, and we had it bolted to the wall you're, you, the way you're supposed to. And it run, has to be rewound every week, but I am amazed at how accurate the thing is, given that it was from 1790, supposedly. I have a tendency to collect themes, and uh, I was on a trip several years ago for a friend's birthday in Europe, and I bought a walking stick. And the next thing I know, I bought this walking stick which was made by the man who did Queen Victoria's. And then I started looking for walking sticks with a vengeance. And so now I have numerous ones. 
that I've collected over the years. A lot of them are dogs. This walking stick, which is a frog, was very similar because my father, father called me frog when I was a little boy. And so I had to have this, this uh, walking stick. And then recently, a friend gave me this one, a crab claw, because they've said as I get older, I become more crabby. The urn of year behind us was something I bought in Paris, and it's, an, it's a Louis Philippe. It's a toll water urn, and normally they sit on a little box, and I think water comes out. But I loved it, and I managed, it's got a liner in it, which sometimes we put flowers in it. I don't. The people that do the flowers do. But... Um, I brought this back in, in, on the plane, and I'm amazed at what Delta has allowed me to bring back uh, over the years. Uh, recently, I brought a big painting back, and I don't know why they let me do it. This was another auction find. Um, it is supposedly painted by a well-known portrait painter uh, from the, I guess, turn of the 18th century, 19th century. But um, I bought it because I like the way the man's cravat is rendered. He's got about 14 different whites, and I just thought it was really a well uh, detailed picture. I hope one day to find out that it is even better than I'd, I'd like to think it is. So, There's a problem in this house. Everything in my house I like to call is scratch and dent, which means if it hadn't been dropped or rolled down the hill at least once, I usually can't afford it. I actually, although the house is all my taste and my selections, I did, you know, collaborate with one of my friends who's a decorator. All the furniture in the house was pretty much bought by me. But what my friend Jane did was she helped me organize it. And um, so it was a collaborative effort. The only thing different from what we would normally do for a client is I got the final say on everything. This is my stair landing, also my sort of small library here. As I mentioned earlier, I really like to read. And uh, I collect everything from biographies to history. I don't do novels, but I always enjoy reading about um, architectural design and so I have a little bit of everything here and there and uh, on the walls here I have some early early maps the two in the middle were before the country was a country and so it has all the Indian nations which I'm very proud of and the one on the top belonged to my grandfather so I sort of made them a uh, combination of a little bit of everything one of the most important things you can have I think in a well-designed home is light and light coming from different directions and so I did not want to have this be just a blank wall with something on it dark. So I put in a window in the bookcases, which opens through to another window, which looks out on the property to the side. And the idea is mainly to introduce light from not only one, two, three, but four directions to make the house a bit more cheery and upbeat. One of the things that happened earlier alone, I mentioned to a friend of mine that I was going to be reusing this Amari lamp that belonged to my grandmother. And they were like, I can't believe you're going to use that. Those are so old and dated. Nobody collects Amari. So my design friend, Jane, and I decided that we would basically do the entire second floor around this space. So it was the one that inspired the color scheme of everything. And I did that just so people could say, you can actually use Amari in a new, in a new house. Um, there's a lot of things here. I bring souvenirs back. These are old watercolors. This came from... Switzerland. Uh, this is a little watercolor of a palace in St. Petersburg. I love souvenirs and I usually, there's always something in my luggage when I'm coming home. Over here on this side, we've got a Swedish mirror. We've got an Italian table. We've got some, um, I think those are um, pin, pin boxes I bought from the estate of Mario Boada. There's an obelisk here that I just ordered. And then oddly enough, of course, there's a drain that from a broken sink. So that's there too. Um, the flowers were done by my good friend, Mary Donnell. I could not put a flower in a vase and make it work if my life depended on it. But I do think flowers add so much to a room and give the room life, which is what I'm always trying to do. Um, the rest of these drawings, and these are all original watercolors that I've collected over the years, not by me, but they kind of they, they reflect my interest and uh, years and years of collecting. Well, besides the obvious, it's the only time I ever got to have exactly what I wanted, as opposed to having to uh, bend to my collaborating de decorative friends or decorative landscapers. I think it's mainly because it's surrounded by everything in the house means something to me. The chair behind the camera was my grandmother's. Um, the uh, pictures on the wall in there, some of those were taken directly from both grandparents. Uh, there's a boxer dog up there. My grandfather loved his boxers um, and uh, he raised them. 
And so I look at the dog and it reminds me of him. So for me, my house is basically is a time capsule of my whole life. Welcome to my library. This is where I spend most of my time if I'm not working at the office. Um, this room is full of a lot of things that mean great, a great deal to me. Uh, some big things down to small things. Um, I bought these Scottish prints on the wall. They're prints designed to look extraordinarily 3D. I bought those back in the 90s. Um, the uh, convex mirror here, I saw one night in a shop in London right when the dollar and the pound were at its worst and yet I could not, uh, keep not get it, so I got it. Um, I've been collecting martini shakers over the years. This is about half what I've got. And they're all on top of this old, I think it's Irish table that I bought from a friend, a dealer. Uh, no one else had a room large enough for it. And uh, the chairs on either side are Chinese Chippendale, and I've always had a love of Chippendale. Most people don't care for it that much. But uh, my friend who was working with me on the project, Jane Hope, found these in Atlanta and basically knew enough to load them up and bring them because she knew I wanted them and she was correct. I drink everything from a martini to a gin and tonic to uh, scotch, just depends. Uh, the bar's a little low because of COVID. I used to have more alcohol, but I'm, I'm trying to replenish. I may have mentioned earlier that I have this uh, passion for Egyptian revival. And those are, I have a pair of terracotta sphinxes that I think were originally in a garden, but they're too delicate to be in a garden. I have one here and I have one in my office, but I have a thing for anything that is uh, Egyptian revival. Early on before I built this house, my friend Jane said, quit buying so many small things, you need something large. So I found this English cabinet uh, and decided that would be my large thing. We also figured out it was a great way to hide the TV. So this room was designed around this cabinet and this table and those pair of consoles over there. Everything else was just brought in, but I had already, most of the furniture I had, so when I was designing the room, I knew exactly where it would all have to go. Um, this is um, a painting by a follower of Canaletto. I've always worked, loved the work of Canaletto, so I sadly cannot afford one, but this is a man who was a contemporary who was, um, uh, basically copied Canaletto's Canaletto style, which became very popular. This chair is pr uh, particularly precious to me. This was a chair that belonged to my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother used it when she was writing, uh, paying bills and writing checks. Um, Jane, my designer, suggested I reupholster it in a more stylish pattern. It used to be in blue damask. And so I'm so happy I did because it's given it a whole new life and it's made, it's made me extra proud of it. This is a little cast iron dog I found in Charleston, and um, he was so heavy. He, I don't know what he's made out of it besides cast iron, but I had to have him. And the best thing is, is he doesn't wet the rug and he doesn't bite. When I got out of school, I always thought that I might end up in Virginia or um, Maryland area because I have such a love of history and frankly, a love of the architecture. Of course, that didn't work out and I think I, I was, it was the right decision, but I decided when I was building this house that I would do a house very much inspired by the architecture of that area. And so there's a house in, in, in Maryland that I really liked and so much of the molding and the detail in this house was patterned on that work. Um, I knew that I wanted to do a mantle and I wanted to have an elaborate overmantle because most of my clients won't let me do that. It's a bit too extravagant and I knew I was only going to have this one fireplace that I really wanted to set it off. So we designed everything around the uh, mantle and then the painting I had bought in London. It is a um, fairly well-known artist who did all the paintings at Trinity College, the portraits. And uh, years ago, this uh, room was in a magazine with my Christmas tree, and I got a phone call from a, an, an art, art expert in London who said, I, I know about your painting, and he gave me the whole spiel. Um, it's not the best painting in the world, but now it means extra more to me because it does have a very interesting history. As I said earlier downstairs, um, I have always had a passion for Eagle William Kentish style consoles. And these pair came up, I guess, in the early part of 2000, and I jumped on them, and at the time, they were far beyond my means, but I had to have them. And I've never regretted, and I designed the entire room around this pair of consoles. Um, the lamps are by my good friend, Chris Spitzmiller, 
And then the drawings above it are ones I collected in France, uh, primarily France, over the years um, with some weird accessories. These are micro mosaics. Uh, there's a wonderful ball clock over there that I got from Niall Smith. And uh, Niall has always been another destination that I loved. And um, I also have a huge interest in anything Grand Tour. Um, so you've got these obelisk, which is, there's one in the yard. You've got Trojan's column. And then you've got um, these small micro mosaics that sort of re reinforce that theme. So really, if there's anything Grand Tour and not nailed down, I will try to buy it and take it. I'm very fortunate to have a lot of talented friends and many of them have written books. And of course, I insist on getting a signed copy. And the books that are particularly dear to me are all right here on this table. But when I have a party, of course, I have to pass out coasters because I can't let anybody ruin the books. But if you've written a book for me, your book is here um, and signed somewhere in this pile here. I have a thing for pieces of furniture that do things like rise up, tilt over, swing around. And this is a, I guess, early 19th century French writing uh, architect's table or drawing lectern. And I found this and it was at home. I really liked the people and so I bought it from them. And I keep some of my nicest books here. Uh, this is a very rare book. This is uh, a book on the work of Meller, Meggs and Howe. And it's, it's all a book on one farm that was built outside of, it's in, in uh, Laverock, Pennsylvania. And the farm only existed for about 10 years, I think, and then was torn down. But it's one of my favorite books that I have. I think unless you're on the run uh, under the, sort of the FBI relocation program, I think it's nice to have something from your past. Um, I, you know, not everybody's fortunate to have beautiful things. I got that, I understand that. But I think it's nice when you can have a piece of your history. It's the same way that people name their children after previous generations. I think that's always lovely. It kind of gives someone sort of a grounding and an establishment. And to walk in here and see, and again, I'm surrounded things from the last 50 years of my life. And so I really like having that. And it's sort of, I, I, just, I can't imagine if walking into a room that I did not know something about almost everything in there. It'd be like being in a hotel. In the original plan of my house, this was going to be a small office where I could work at home at night. And I, early, I learned early on that I would never do that. I'd rather just stay at the office and work and then come home and separate myself from whatever was keeping me going that day. So it's become sort of an annex library. I have a lot of my design books in here, as well as a wall of family photographs. I consider myself to be the sort of keeper of the family photographs. This is a, friend, a Regency writing desk again, that tilts up. It's one of my favorite things I have. And uh, on it are my parents, myself when I was much younger, my grandfather who made me bald. Um, this is a steer horn that my grandfather brought back from a medical convention in Miami Beach, uh, Mexico City, excuse me, in uh, the 30s. I had to have this. And um, the, these are all my family. Welcome to my kitchen. It's a sad tale because I don't really cook, um, but I have had some amazing parties here and people like to gravitate around this big counter um, because it's easier than trying to sit down. And when I designed this house, I designed it for casual entertaining. So I have a glass porch, screen porch, right off this through these glass doors. I was visiting some friends of mine years ago in Maine and admired their butler's pantry, which had black cabinets and mahogany tops. And I never quite forgot them. So when it came chance to design my own kitchen, I did the black cabinets and mahogany tops and stainless steel in honor of what I saw in Maine. So I'm most grateful guys, thank you. Well, I think a home is really supposed to sort of be uh, an indicator and a frame of your life for the person who lives there. And so because my home is probably the result decorative wise of 30 years of collecting, I think people instantly get some sense of who I, who I am. And I think that's always nice. I don't like walking into a house that looks like it was all bought in one weekend at the Decorative Arts Center. I like houses that have that collected look. And uh, I will say this house looked pretty much like this six months after I moved in because before it was built, I spent 30 years buying things for it. 
everything was bought into kind of place in the house that was in my head. And I think that's important is I like houses that are not generic. Um, I like them to be very personal. Uh, this is my porch. Every house in the South needs at least one porch. And I've been very pleased with this one. I wish sometimes I had a fireplace out here, but what it does is it has the fountain on one side and easy access to the kitchen uh, for something to eat or drink, but it's been very successful with my friends. Originally, there was going to be a fireplace on this wall, and I realized not only was it really kind of beyond my budget, it was also a way to kill the view of the yard. And so I changed to, the, to this more Jeffersonian arch ceiling with the, the uh, half light, round light at the top to let light in and make it more light. And I'm very glad I did not do the fireplace. I think it had been too much for me. This is sort of my serving butler's pantry. I don't have a butler and barely have a server, uh, but it's a place for me to stage things for the dining room here. Um, I think earlier someone mentioned about China. I don't really get into China, but whenever I see a good deal, I will pick it up. So I've been collecting uh, Spode Grecian over the years, which is kind of a nice kind of um, uh, Beaux-Arts paper. And then I found several estates that have closed out. Uh, I believe this, these plates are particularly nice. They're so delicate. I don't use them very often because I don't want to break them. But then I have a whole lot of these, and they seem to be pretty much bulletproof. So the other ones who get used the most. And this is my dining room. Uh, I'm more of a TV tray kind of guy, but this room is here when I do need it. Um, I made the room octagonal for several reasons. I particularly like an octagonal room or a round room, and this seemed to be the perfect reason for doing it. Um, the screen there is French, um, and it's the only place in the house I had a wall large enough for it after I put all the other stuff in. But the table is French. The uh, cellarette belonged to the architect Philip Schutze in Atlanta, one of my idols. So I'm very happy to get that. Uh, the silver tray was a gift from my dear friend, the late Julia Reed, who I miss terribly. And um, the chairs are actually new chairs that I had painted. Um, and oddly enough, they look like they're covered in red leather, but that's not red leather. That is latex paint over white vinyl. And I did it because I had to have it done for a party. And the first night I walked in and saw a lady in white pants sitting down on my painted chairs, I got really worried, but the paint has held up. Uh, and that was eight years ago. So I probably will never ever upholster these chairs in leather at all. I bought these at auction recently. These are uh, Fitzhugh and they're a memorial and the, 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 um, the crest has something to do with the Dutch royal family. But these are things you pour hot water in and they keep the plates warm, which I thought was pretty cool. And again, they're in my favorite color, which is orange. And so I, those were, nobody else seemed to want them, so I got them. And in here, um, I wanted to paint the room orange from day one, and Jane suggested we go with this bit softer color, this apricot color. And then I think together we came up with the idea that it'd be really cool if it were lacquered. So we lacquered it with the idea that it would be particularly pretty at night uh, for the few times I have a dinner party. This is one of the few hallways in my house and I decided to make it something of a mini art gallery. And um, these are all Grand Tour gouaches, which is a type of watercolor from Italy. And almost every one of them has a night scene or a day scene of a volcano exploding. But more they have, more for me, they have a lot of blue light, and I think the blue reminds me of the beach and the water and uh, the Adriatic, and so all of that is something that I enjoy seeing. I particularly enjoy seeing the ones at night, uh, but these were all meant to indicate to people that you had been to Italy and Naples and seen and done sort of a grand tour. I just like a, a certain sense of continuity. Um, if I could have found a house in Birmingham that was an old one that I liked, I would have probably bought it because I love the bones of an old house. 
but many of the ones I looked at were either in, uh, not in a great location or they were in such poor condition I would have spent a fortune. So at a certain point I realized I had to create what I wanted. And that allowed me to basically get as little as I needed and I don't have a lot of extraneous rooms I don't use. Um, um, I live alone and so this house is like a really large condo. Uh, but there are rooms upstairs and downstairs for people if they want them. Uh, guests stay upstairs of course usually. And, uh, but the house was designed for me uh, very much like a custom suit. Oh, pardon me. You're in the powder room now. Uh, when we were coming up the design for this, um, I had originally wanted some kind of interesting uh, uh, chinoiserie paper or something, and my designer, Jane Hope, said, why don't you try Italian cork? And I fell in love with it. I have a slight interest in 70s um, kind of glamour design and so I'm one of my favorite things in this house is this uh, court wallpaper and we mixed it in with other things most of the art here more of the gouaches there's a small oil painting a French one this is the only contemporary painting in the house uh, it is from the it's French and from the 40s and I bought it in Charleston at the antique show there and I've been in love with it ever since. And it's sort of a joke. I have it behind the door in the powder room because most of my guests don't expect to see anything new in this house. But over the next couple of years, one of my goals is to introduce more of this type of thing in the house to sort of update and kind of give the house a new look and a new life. Uh, welcome to my bedroom. Uh, this is on the main level of the house and convenient for an rapidly aging architect. Um, this room, when I was a little boy, I had the most beautiful room. It's a big rectangle shared with my brother. And my brother moved out and I was left with the biggest room any boy could ever want. But I always wanted a bedroom upstairs in the attic because I thought that would be more interesting. So I designed this house such that even though my bedroom is on the main level, it feels like it may be in the attic. And so everything was designed to make it as cozy as possible. Um, this fabric, which is from Robert Keim, was the only floral that I really, really liked. Uh, and I liked it with the dark green. And uh, people wonder if I'll ever get tired of the dark green. And I say there's no way I ever will because I love it so much. Um, the bed was designed and inspired by one at the Sleeper Museum in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, I thought it was the coolest idea in the world and it was a great way for me to get a four-poster bed not unlike the one I had at home, but this one is designed to fit the break of the ceiling. One of the things I liked about the ceiling in this room is it allowed me to do something particularly charming. So once you're in the room, you see my fireplace, the ever-present bookcases that I have in the house, as well as the arch door going back into the main part of the house. But for me, it's the perfect size room. It's very cozy. And I've got my wingback chair that belonged to my grandparents there in case I ever want to sit down and read. Oddly enough, I put a television in this house and in 10 years this television has never been cut on. Uh, I, <laughs> I can't understand why but I've never used it. But under it is a wonderful um, cast iron bear that belonged to my friend Julia Reed's grandfather. That when, when it was up for auction I don't think very many people knew what it, who, what it was and so I managed to get it. And then beside that I have my grandfather Lazenby who managed to make me ball at an early age. So thank you. This is my dressing room area and um, I am not really a bathroom person. I wanted my dressing room to feel pretty much just an extension of my bedroom. So instead of having cold marble floors, I have wood floors and then I put my sink in with my clothing and kept the toilets and showers and everything like that completely separate. So it doesn't look like a bathroom and that was done on purpose. We upholstered uh, the walls in this Schumacher stripe and then we went back to the floral from the bedroom and then a friend of mine had suggested collecting silhouettes so I've been collecting silhouettes. So again another collection that I pull together now and then whenever I see one. Home is, um, I would say it's the, the, the vessel that you live your life. Um, Years ago, I read an article about where the person was saying he was trying to sort of create a backdrop. And I think 
a well-designed home is the backdrop for the lifestyle and the personality of the people that live there. If you are a prisoner of your own home and you feel you must adapt to your own home, I think it's probably something slightly amiss. Um, the people that I admire sort of command their homes, and even if they're very large ones, and live in them, and, and it's their place, and it's their nest. And uh, I admire that and try to, try to somewhat emulate that in my house on a smaller scale. Thanks for watching. For more homeworthy content, be sure to like and subscribe.